under triple p projects second paper will be jointly presented by shri tanmay tathagat from esd and ms apurva chaturvedi us8 on net zero energy building for railway stations and building third paper is by shri sudhir saxena from remcl on renewable energy opportunities in indian railways now i hand over the proceeding to session chair shri krishan dhawan to start the technical session one with introduction of speakers uh, thank you very much and good afternoon everybody and thank you for your attention uh, we will, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today sri shivram krishnamurthy who was with the ifc and joined in 2010 and is presently the operations officer for clean energy and resource efficiency at IFC. IFC, as you all should know, is a member of the World Bank Group, which is the largest global development institution focused on private sector uh, in emerging markets. He has done his BTEC in electrical and electronics from the University of Calicut and an MBA from Madras University. And prior to joining IFC, he was working with this uh, CII Green Business Center. He's uh, credited with the publication of multiple best practice papers uh, in, in, in this area and we look forward to his uh, presentation on structuring grid interactive rooftop solar projects uh, through green energy PPP projects. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Chairman, uh, Mr. Dhavanji, uh, all the other dignitaries on the dais, uh, uh, railway board uh, uh, members. Uh, after a very uh, enthusiastic speech from the uh, from the from the board and from the from the ministers, uh, we are kind of uh, starting the business where um, the nuts and bolts are being discussed. Uh, the task is huge. Uh, before the team, where a wide range of subjects are being discussed in terms of uh, decarbonization of uh, railways, whether it is the power procurement, efficiency, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we would like to uh, start this uh, session with something uh, related to the renewable energy uh, procurement. Mostly, it would be non-traction in nature. That's the subject that I would be uh, I would be covering. Uh, we would. Uh, uh, how much of a time do I have, uh, sir? Ten minutes. Okay, right. Uh, we'll try to have this discussion scheduled in about uh, about ten minutes, followed by some uh, questions later on. Um, Essentially, I wanted to uh, throw light on the PPP structuring experiences that we have, uh, but essentially before that, a small introduction about uh, IFC. Uh, IFC, for those of you who do not know, is a part of the World Bank Group. The difference between uh, IBRD, which is uh, known as World Bank in India, and IFC is that IFC is the private sector uh, private sector arm of the group. We work with the uh, more with the private sector, whereas IBRD works more with uh, governments as well as subnational uh, institutions. Uh, there is both an advisory and an investment wing and uh, the value proposition is that there is a country based uh, structure a long term uh, competitive financing as well as regional uh, teams working with the with the teams this is the uh, investment project cycle uh, i do not want to uh, want to dwell much on this but it's like any other uh, commercial bank there is an early review uh, due diligence process a very detailed uh, disclosure process commitment and monitoring for the uh, for the investment deals that we do and uh, there is a range of financial products that we can uh, work with, whether it is equity, mezzanine, quasi-equity structures, and uh, senior debt as well as the equivalent structures. So the entire range of financial uh, products can be uh, can be offered, and uh, we think uh, association with the railways in all the capacities, whether it is advisory or investments, would be would be great, and that's the reason we are supporting the program as well. <coughs> Uh, in terms of uh, the topic of the day, uh, by and large, uh, there is an experience across a wide range of uh, renewables, uh, some of which is very, very applicable to uh, railways. Uh, I would say uh, the mention of wind and solar uh, that way has been uh, has been uh, made uh, in the first session, and the scale-up opportunities is uh, is large in this. Uh, we have seen the kind of uh, fall in uh, rates. Uh, 
uh, minister was mentioning about the procurement uh, of LEDs as similarly the rates of solar power is something which has uh, fallen over a period of time and as a country and as an organization we also think that railways can take advantage of this. Uh, improve on the green uh, procurement of uh, of uh, of power and overall can pass on these benefits to the wider uh, wider stakeholders um, having said that there are three models which are uh, which are followed one is the traditional built on operate capital model the second is the model in which the first uh, inauguration of 5 megawatt has been done it is called the opex or the uh, ppa model essentially this is a model whereby private sector comes and invests capital in the facility there is most a competitive bidding which is uh, offered and you sell power to the entity in this case the railways on uh, something called a PPA so the terms and conditions of the PPA become uh, very important and uh, this is uh, well suited for distributed generation like uh, solar the last there is something called a leasing model not very famous in uh, India at this point in time uh, a couple of technical slides uh, in terms of rooftop solar uh, development if it is rooftop then uh, one can have it behind the meter one can have it beyond the meter uh, there are uh, a couple of terms like net metering and gross metering which one has to be aware about and that's more on a regulatory uh, thing uh, the other way one can purchase power is to uh, through open access by the wheeling uh, facility which we, we had been uh, which has also been a point of discussion in the uh, in the morning <coughs> Going uh, ahead, uh, we will give some small uh, history about one of the first projects that was implemented in the PPP model in um, uh, Gandhinagar. This is on distributed uh, rooftop uh, solar and uh, the business model and the transaction structure can be, uh, can be looked at as a possible uh, uh, proof of uh, concept here. Uh, as I said, uh, the appropriateness is that it's a generating facility that you can have at your own um, your own facility and you can enter into something known as a PPA with the developer and thereby there is no capital expenditure that you are incurring the the developer develops the facility using this money and then sells the power uh, uh, power to you <coughs> Uh, we had structured this in something called a gross metering um, uh, a gross metering structure in that time uh, it can now also be structured in a in a net metering uh, kind of model uh, here the uh, the concept is very simple you have a PV panel you have an, a grid uh, tied inverter and the whatever is the power is generated you send it to the grid and you get paid for that uh, your house or whatever it is gets uh, connected to the grid and receives the electricity the way it is receiving electricity right now that's the gross metering model uh, any uh, any uh, I would take a couple of minutes to uh, discuss this uh, we have all been uh, looking at the price uh, uh, fall in various things uh, like solar power for example uh, all these risks are there in the project once uh, uh, once a structuring is being done there is something called the off taker risk that has to be mitigated primarily because nobody would come uh, to invest in a project where the off taker risk is not mitigated so in this case it has to be the off uh, the off taker has to be railways uh, and then it has to be accompanied with uh, things like deemed generation take or pay etc etc which essentially means that me as a developer i am ready with my project whereas if you are not taking that power then that is a financial risk for me uh, the regulatory risk is basically things like interconnection schemes, uh, the tariff uh, being not viable, etc., etc. In that case, what kind of a financial arrangement can be done? Uh, the technical risk is, uh, especially uh, in far-off areas, what kind of a grid availability is there? Uh, this has to be. Uh, uh, this is something which is crucial. Uh, solar generation is uh, dependable on the. Uh, on the availability of the sun and then at that point in time if there is a uh, outage of the grid beyond a certain uh, uh, certain uh, time then uh, it has to be considered as a as a failure on your part and then the risk has to be addressed uh, accordingly all these goes into the into the transaction mechanism and the most important structure then is uh, the kind of clustering because unlike uh, 
unlike a traditional uh, ground mounted uh, project this is one of the risks where there are, uh, where the uh, where the risk is very high supposing you have uh, contracted out a certain uh, capacity based on the availability of a certain number of roofs and then if it is a far flung location the developer goes there not able to find the roof or has to undertake three or four trips just to uh, just to uh, just to secure the roof for his then obviously the transaction cost goes up and then it becomes a loss making proposition for him and at the end of the day you can't have that kind of a of a of a tariff because nobody would uh, would kind of continue or set up a loss making project and live with it um, at the end of the day lenders uh, uh, lenders look at all these things and uh, security insurance termination benefits etc etc all these things has to be looked at uh, when you are uh, structuring this kind of a this kind of a of a project and any lack in uh, this uh, structuring or any lacuna in structuring any of these bids would result in a higher uh, tariff so the kind of attractive tariffs that was mentioned in the morning it's a result of a number of things that has uh, been put into the bid process and any lacuna in addressing any of these things would result in a higher tariff and that would mean that the higher vision of 41k uh, savings might not be achievable or would take a longer time to achieve the same <clears throat> so in this case the key activities uh, that were being undertaken is is, is a detailed uh, roof survey which uh, railways also need to undertake the financial structuring stakeholder consultations like the ones which we have and then the uh, then the uh, bid structuring and and that uh, essentially this is the legal sector there is a project implementation agreement between the developers there is a lease agreement with the rooftop owners and then there is a ppa with the utility which in this case is torrent by and large these elements would go into any of this uh, structuring uh, agreements and this is the way it is uh, it is structured and interrelated and these are the technical and the financial terms that would be there in these uh, in these uh, agreements and how the uh, how the agreements are interrelated the tariffs were of course uh, 2010 to 12 this is one of the first project which was undertaken in the uh, in the mode and compared to these tariffs which is like almost an 8 rupees uh, tariff for the developer with 3 rupees as a rental now the tariffs are are down to half which has been announced today today morning and we think that this trends are likely to continue there are some of the installations just for your uh, reference if somebody is going to gandhinagar maybe have a look at it uh, in the net metering structure the same thing can be replicated the only thing is there needs to be a vigorous interaction between the utility and the rooftop owner in this case uh, uh, the existing billing structure and the related complications also need to be addressed but as long as a consumer is concerned by and large it is the same he doesn't know whether the power comes from the solar energy or uh, it comes from the grid this is how uh, the difference uh, looks like when it is presented uh, graphically only thing is the termination point is the distribution panel at home and then the power can go either into the uh, into the into the load if the load is available otherwise it can go back into the grid then there is something called a bidirectional flow of energy which the net meter has to take care of and then related to that you have to introduce the banking uh, mechanism so this is something where you have to work with the utility to make it understand and in operate this at that level uh, the stakeholder concerns more or less are uh, are addressed i had also uh, discussed this in the first one and it has to be uh, uh, mitigated um, the tariffs as i said has been coming down it has been coming down over the last 4 or 5 years we expect this to be uh, this to be uh, a future in the ongoing uh, this thing also only thing is the rate of decline would uh, would now decrease Uh, a couple of things on uh, on proliferation uh, we are also now doing a proliferation uh, initiative of the same with the renewable agency in the state of orissa this is called uh, oreda the whole uh, the whole attempt is to uh, make this concept reach to the reach to the consumer it's more of a difficult exercise than a bid exercise but this is the ultimate uh, winning point this is what we uh, we believe uh, has to be the has to be the one this is one of the examples of a private sector engagement this is a famous brand called h&m they are also moving to sustainability the point being that uh, it is railways 
tendering process, utilities, this is one set of themes. There is another set of themes which is coming from the private sector in terms of their own uh, initiatives in terms of uh, both a better carbon footprint as well as achieving a reduction in energy costs. Um, essentially key, take, uh, key takeaways, ground mounted and roof mounted systems has to be treated uh, differently. Availability of the rooftops, the rooftop inventory, uh, accuracy of the rooftop inventory, availability of the rooftop in inventory, any of the uh, issues here can result in a higher uh, bid tariff, assured offtake, take or pay, these are uh, required for uh, the financial closure, contractual structure, legal payment, robust payment security mechanism which the minister addressed in the morning, very, very critical to uh, bringing down the, down the costs given the trend in the declining tariff the margins of error has become very, very minimal. So if somebody quotes very, very aggressively, there is a margin of error, the margin of error happens, the issue is that financial closure will be far off and the debt equity ratio has to change, the overall interest in the project and execution comes down. That's not what any of us want. For scaling up, especially in other places, uh, clear permitting provisions are required. And finally, for all these things, access to uh, finance is the key. And if there is a need to have all these things at far-flung areas like the railways, it's easier to do it in cities. It's difficult to structure this in far-flung areas. Uh, appropriately, mitigation mechanism has to be arranged. Uh, appropriately, access to finance has to be arranged. For all these things, we as a global multilateral institution uh, more than keen to partner with railways in this regard. Uh, thank you, and uh, uh, we can have the uh, questions later on. Thanks. Thank you, Shivram. So as uh, Shivram uh, illustrated, uh, for meeting the uh, potential non-traction needs of the railways, clearly the, the PPP model is a useful alternative to leverage resources, both technical and, and capital. And given uh, the lowering costs in uh, the renewable energy sector and the stability of technology, uh, there's a significant opportunity to expand and multiple business models uh, that are available in the market that the railways could potentially use. And given uh, just the inauguration this morning of the uh, rooftop solar installations uh, at the Delhi railway stations, clearly uh, there's a lot of momentum and interest that can be uh, taken forward uh, across the, the country uh, at the, the network of railway stations that the Indian Railways manages. So thank you very much. So we're moving on to the second <coughs> paper, which is on net zero energy buildings for railway stations and buildings. And the presenters are Apurva Chaturvedi, who is currently working as clean energy specialist at USID India, where she's worked for 12 years in clean energy and in, in the environment sector. And she currently leads the energy efficiency uh, portfolio and smart grids portfolio, and has previously worked um, at the British Council. Also speaking is Tanmay Tathaghat, who is uh, the director of the Environmental Design Solutions Group. He brings a background of architecture and uh, engineering uh, and over the last 20 years has worked on green building initiatives at, at a number of venues. So uh, may I invite you to make a presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dhawan. And uh, first of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Indian Railways for partnering with us on this important initiative. And uh, just taking a lead from what the minister spoke in the morning about how LED bulbs really transformed the lighting markets, how it really changed the way um, uh, it actually made a difference at uh, not only in terms of the energy savings, but what a consumer pays. So basically in the bills, in the tariffs. Uh, the same um, vision, uh, it, it's just a small LED bulb example. But imagine a scenario where a power consumer like Indian Railways, probably the largest in the country as far as the power consumption is concerned. If it has to really go uh, and transform um, in a, into a sector where it really consumes lesser power and becomes the most efficient, secure, reliable means of transport in the country. Uh, and that's what, in a very small uh, way, we would, uh, we are trying to partner, um, work with Indian Railways on bringing in the net zero energy building vision. 
uh, for the Indian Railways. But before I get into that, uh, just a small uh, sort of a brief about uh, USAID and the US-India cooperation on clean energy, which has been there for a couple of decades now, uh, where we work with the government of India on uh, uh, bringing transformative technologies on clean energy, both on the energy efficiency and the renewable side. And for the last uh, couple of years, we've also been uh, very lucky that we've been uh, working with Indian Railways uh, to bring in some of the clean energy transformations here as well. Uh, this started with uh, our bilateral program, Partnership to Advance Clean Energy uh, Deployment, Phase D, uh, which, uh, and it's, we now are very fortunate that we've launched a new program called METRI, which is Market Integration and Transformation for Energy Efficiency, where we are working with Indian Railways, uh, both on the renewable side, but also on how they can actually build in the most sustainable manner, in the most efficient green manner, and that's the net zero energy building vision that I'll be talking about and my uh, colleague Tanmay will be talking about. So first of all, I would definitely like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Sudhir Garg, Mr. Puneet, and his team, uh, who have been extremely proactive, and, uh, and that's the reason why when we started working with them just a year back, and we developed the Net Zero Energy Building vision um, uh, and the guidelines for Indian Railways, they were, I think, approved by the Railway Board in, not le in just maybe one week or two weeks, if I'm right, Mr. Garg. So um, um, that's the kind of... Uh, uh, proactive partners that we have with Indian Railways and I'm sure this vision will translate into reality very soon through our partnership in the coming years. Uh, so this is what we started with, as I said, the Net Zero Energy Building vision and uh, um, that's already been approved. And the idea is how do we get from the vision state to the actual implementation stage and that's what we hope to do now. So we started with, first of all, what a net zero energy uh, building would mean for Indian railways, what would be the kind of performance standards, the technical specifications, and uh, then how does it get integrated into the procurement system of Indian railways, where every time uh, there is a tender for construction, it already has the performance specifications for the most efficient building or facility um, that would be uh, coming up in the near future. And then what, how do we uh, go through the uh, different steps uh, from the, uh, let's say, the vision stage, the design stage, the procurement stage, and then um, while the construction is on, and even as far as the post-construction and the post-occupancy uh, uh, stages. And of course, very importantly, even once the once the design, once the building is there, uh, whether it is really performing according to the net zero energy uh, building, uh, you know, specifications. And most importantly, we would also be working with Indian Railways on capacity building. So here we are, we have partnered with Railways, but, and we would uh, actually handholding the engineers and the professionals working with the Indian Railways on actually um, uh, sort of um, uh, giving them this handholding support to see that they are geared up to, um, you know, understand what is a net zero energy building and go about its implementation as well. So we would be working uh, with the Indian Railway Engineers uh, Institute also to see that this actually gets incorporated as part of their curriculum as well in the near future. So this is just a snapshot of some buildings that Indian Railways has. It ranges from, let's say, a railway station to a railway terminal to some railway offices, housing facilities, and so on. This is how the buildings look like as of today. And if you look at this graph, this just shows the non-traction energy use uh, projected uh, till 2020. Uh, as of now, in a normal case scenario and a business as usual scenario. But suppose if the Indian Railways were to go the net zero energy way, if you look at this graph, it shows in the first bar there is a, a typical building uh, which consumes this much of power. But uh, what the government of India has already sort of um, come up with is the Energy Conservation Building Code, the ECBC, which sets the minimum performance criteria for a building, for a commercial building. Then uh, if the railway were to go this route, then their actual energy demand would come down from a normal scenario. 
if the indian railways went one step ahead and went ahead with ratings like griha or igbc or a lead platinum or so and so then if you look at this particular bar there is a slight green portion to it which means that the building is not only consuming energy but it is also producing some amount of energy and if you go the next bar if you see the net zero energy where the yellow and the green portions are equal which means a net zero energy building actually means the building uh, produces as much energy as it consumes on an annual basis so that's what the vision we are hoping that uh, indian railways will uh, move ahead with and probably in the near future why not no, why only net zero energy but even energy positive which is the uh, real vision um, that could come so uh, we are working on two aspects uh, one is the redevelopment of the existing indian railway stations and also the upcoming new stations and the station facilities uh, there is a huge opportunity to build sustainably uh, retrofitting as we were just discussing uh, right now just before uh, we started the session retrofitting is always much tougher and i'm sure as engineers and professionals here you all realize that uh, retrofitting or changing the already existing facilities is a much harder step much more time consuming energy consuming a uh, cost consuming exercise uh, whereas if you uh, were to uh, if you are making those 400 new station facilities or 1000 new station facilities in the very new near future and you stop ahead and change the way you build and you build it in the most highest efficient manner uh, with the uh, you know not only the building design the building envelope the different aspects of the building whether it's the heating and the cooling loads whether it's the lighting loads the glass glazing all that if it is built in the most efficient manner your demand automatically comes down and and then you can actually meet that demand through the uh, renewable targets that you already have in place so as far as the existing ir stations uh, they can also go for a rating system any of these whether it's a griha or igbc or a lead platinum it also would lead uh, to substantial energy savings almost 50% reduction from the current energy use and not only are we talking about energy because at the end of the day the railways is committed to the common man of the country and therefore the comfort is a important uh, very very important aspect of that the, even if you can uh, decrease the energy consumption the comfort uh, doesn't have to be compromised on and therefore that actually results in a better occupancy comfort and of course uh, meet the uh, resultant demand in, uh, demand from the buildings uh, through renewable means and this is what the new station the vision for the new station development is that it not only becomes net zero in terms of its energy consumption but also becomes net zero as far as the water runoff from the facilities is concerned also becomes a net zero waste and uh, also achieves uh, the rating in these forms so but we've been talking about net zero but what does it actually mean does it uh, it and it has several definitions if you start googling or reading the literature around it has a lot of uh, meanings but for a country like us a building that actually produces as much energy in a typical on a typical annual basis as it consumes so it's not on a daily basis so not on a uh, monthly basis but on an annual basis and it consumes the grid power when it needs it but it also feeds into the grid when it has excess of energy produced so that's what a net zero energy building we mean for um, for a country like ours and uh, so this is almost so these are the key factors one is buildings so it's not as if you have a building and you offset all the energy through renewables and claim that this is a net zero energy building the building has to first of all have the lowest energy demand which is through making it highly efficient um especially your heating and cooling loads then you offset that energy uh, through renewables whether it is on off site on site whatever you have uh, you know you reduce the embodied energy of the materials that are used for building the uh, facility and of course also reduce the transport that's required for taking the material from here to there uh, with that i would uh, uh, maybe uh, invite tanmay um, he is a lead expert working on this uh, working with indian railways on a very regular basis so tanmay thank you so i'll just very quickly run through uh, i think most of you have already uh, you know what the 
whole concept of uh, net zero is what we wanted to emphasize is that it's a philosophy that runs across from the first conception of the project all the way to post construction and management and therefore it means that every uh, member of the uh, uh, team that uh, builds, operates and manages uh, needs to be engaged in this process. The approach to net zero energy buildings requires looking at energy efficiency at the time of design, looking at simple things like insulation in the wall and roof that reduces the ingress of heat, better glass, more efficient cooling system, appropriate orientation, shading, these are all very, very basic things. But the idea is that if you use it all in an integrated way, along with things like insulation, for example, uh, wall insulation cuts down your energy ingress by, say, about 10 to 20 percent. And this is something that works both for new and existing buildings. Of course, for existing buildings, it's not possible everywhere to add insulation in the same way. But in many places, uh, in many kinds of structures, it's possible. Roof insulation is definitely possible in all kinds of buildings. And not only that, one of the advantages is you get lower temperature inside. So for buildings that are not necessarily air conditioned, this ensures that you have more number of hours where you're comfortable. Roof, of course, Apart from the fact that we're using roof for generating energy through solar, you're also looking at how do you make it more green. There are options of now, you know, technology has changed where green roofs used to be a problem of water leaking and all those. That is not a case anymore. And with the footprint that railways has, for example, just imagine that if, you know, if the, if the roofs are also green, uh, it adds a lot to the overall impact on the environment. The last aspect is if the roof cannot be green or solar, definitely make it white so that you reflect the light and reflect the heat. And this is also a proven thing. So, so these, there are paints available, there are tiles that do that and that reflect all the heat outside. Glass, the new energy conservation building code which was just announced uh, has a provision for high performance glass and window systems. That means it's not just the glass, but the frame, the shading, everything needs to work so that you get the light, you get the views, but you don't get the heat inside the building. Similarly, for new buildings especially, integration of daylight now is a minimum requirement in the building code. In a country like India, where we have abundant sunlight, it is actually, I would say, almost a crime to design structures where you require lights to be switched on inside all the time. So, and it's a simple design intervention that doesn't actually cost anything to put this into specification. So that's one thing that we need to incorporate. And control systems that make sure that the light goes in, there is no glare, there are deployment of shades when required, all of this is a part of a standard design practice that can be incorporated in the, in the new buildings. Efficient lighting and controls uh, is integrated with daylighting. So whenever the lights are, uh, you know, it's evening, you see this street lights or other common lights on the time. Of course, manual controls are there, but now it needs to be all controlled in a way that you know wastage of energy. Similarly, on air conditioning system, we can go through, there are natural air conditioning systems, there are ground source heating and cooling systems that are all now mainstream. And with the scale that railway has, it can actually be quite uh, cost effective as well, as the minister said in the morning. So, the final bit is what we bring, it's not a part of the design, but the efficient use and the right kind of appliances and equipment, whether it is computers, whether it is the internal uh, equipment in the kitchen and other things, there is now a, a standard that can be used for making sure that you get the most efficient appliances uh, to, uh, and this is done through, again, procurement and as well as consumer education, because you have to do this also in our residences. And finally, of course, renewable energy integration, we talked about that. So I'll just tell you a few examples and we'll close. Globally, Net zero energy buildings is now part of the regulations in most countries. 
So uh, countries have put in a timeline by this date, all new buildings are going to be net zero. Examples of Netherlands, Denmark, UK, where there's a step by step, and you say by, you know, mostly by 2020, 2025, most countries are committing. So I'm just showing this to show that there is actually no barrier in terms of technologies or products, because if there's old countries and continents are going this way, all of this is actually available for us. Some international case studies, this will be available through you, so I'm just running through. There's a net zero uh, energy building, sh very interesting showcase in Singapore, which is in a climate like Singapore, which is hot and humid, runs for a large number of hours on natural ventilation. But they've made the building comfortable that you can actually work in an office environment with natural ventilation. And we are in fact in India going the other way around. Uh, one of the most famous building is the NREL facility in Colorado, uh, one of the pioneering buildings, uh, which is a net zero energy office building. Malaysia did some very interesting examples, again a very difficult climate, hot and humid, to make uh, net zero energy building offices. Uh, Germany of course, and in India, the Indra Paryavaran Bhavan, the Ministry of Environment office, is a net zero energy building, been operational for a few years. Akshay Urja Bhavan in Hareda, in Panchkula. Uh, there are some prototypes of residential buildings, two room, two bedroom apartments, standalone. Uh, grid Corporation office in Bhuvaneshwar. Uttar Haryana Bijli Vitrun Nagam office in Panchkula. Uh, a campus building in Sept in Ahmedabad. The new Nalanda University, uh, IIT Jodhpur, they're all going to be net zero energy campuses. So this is Nalanda. So all of this is something that, you know, at a large scale uh, is happening globally. But in India, I think railway is going to be the first uh, large scale uptake in an institutional way and is going to actually transform just like, you know, the LEDs did for that. This is what railways is an opportunity to do for buildings through net zero. And we're proud to be associated with it. Thank you so much. Namaskar. Uh, thank you, Apoorva and, and Tanmay. I think uh, it's a very exciting concept uh, and actually a net zero building. Um, and given uh, the significant footprint and real estate ownership at the railways between stations, uh, offices, residences, factories, workshops, I think the potential uh, for exploration is, is indeed very significant. As, as was pointed out, I think <coughs> the uh, the thought process has to be applied uh, from the very beginning, from the design stage, and then move it on to the materials that are being used, the equipment that's being installed, and finally to the uh, uh, operations of the buildings, uh, just to make sure the maximum benefits are realized. And while this is an energy-related conservation uh, conversation, uh, there is potential to to extend. Uh, the, uh, the the focus beyond energy to to water and and to waste um, so I think it would be with great interest we, we would uh, we would track how how this concept is is applied uh, across the railways uh, moving on to the the third and final paper of this, uh, of this session uh, which is on renewable energy opportunity in the Indian railways uh, our presenter is Shri Sudhir Kumar Saxena, who is currently working as the Chief Executive Officer in the Railway Energy Management Consulting uh, Management Company, and he's a 1984 batch officer of the Indian Railways, holding a degree uh, in B.Tech Electrical from IIT Roorkee and an M.Tech in Power Systems from IIT Delhi. Uh, he brings a significant experience uh, in the railways, uh, both uh, on the electrical side and on the telecommunication side. And he's now going to be speaking on the opportunities uh, in renewable energy. Thank you very much for giving the opportunity for speaking here. Uh, I only want to say about this railway, uh, the use of solar energy in the railway is uh, age old and in fact uh, I myself is witnessing in more than 30 years. And all of the seniors and uh, my colleagues, etc., in the railway, they must have, they already are working very hard. And then they have, uh, over a period of time, the solar, uh, use of solar energy has been, uh, of course, being increased gradually. Uh, with the mature in technology and the cost coming down, uh, the focus has really gone very high. And then uh, railway board is also working very hard. Uh, and all of our minister is also focusing that we have to go for a, uh, for harnessing renewable energy in a big way. 
<coughs> so uh, with this concept that how to work out in a focused manner uh, this company railway energy management company was formed and it has uh, a structure about of 49% is holding uh, with the uh, in, in ministry of railways and 51% is from rights it was incorporated in august 2013 and its key focus areas business areas are planning and execution of renewable energy projects which of course it is taking a large and which i will be discussing that what all has been done so far and what is the future road map and how we are working then power planning and procurement is another thing which uh, is of course uh, we, we are talking about the saving into the energy of 2000 crore rupees per annum which will be of course increased to say eventually to 10000 crores uh, after we uh, achieve the electrification so all those uh, part how to procure the economical with the most economical manner is what is being done by the rmcl we are also taking the uh, addressing the issues of regulatory matters because once we are migrating to a deemed licensee status we are uh, facing a lot of challenges into the uh, with the state and the states are really uh, giving us a tough time for uh, dealing with these regulatory matters <clears throat> then we are also trying to work out on this transmission line where we can have a direct connectivity with the uh, central transmission utility where we can take the power without the involvement of the state so that will provide us additional benefit to the railways and we can uh, take any amount of power without any uh, restriction uh, from the state or anything then of course consultancy services and capacity building to the ir personnel so giving you a snapshot that how uh, basically what how much is the consumption of the railway we are consuming about 18 billion units every year this uh, 15.5 is uh, for the traction application and 2.5 is for the non traction so almost 85 percent is being accounted towards traction and our key focus is right now uh, to reduce the cost of power for the traction by way of uh, taking the power and the uh, the 2.5 billion unit is about 15 percent of the power which we are taking it through for the non-traction where of course we already have discussed that how to uh, take the solarization how to take the renewable energy into uh, this area so that also I briefly i will sum up on that annual electricity bill has been about 11,000 crore this is a older figure it has really in fact uh, this is uh, right now we have about 9,700 crore is the uh, traction bill and 1,300 crore is for the non-traction so uh, this focus is also to reduce it further is what is being done uh, for the traction purpose the requirement peak requirement is about 2000 and average is about 1800 we uh, with the massive rapid electrification the target the average growth rate will also go very high maybe five to seven percent uh, i am taking a conservative figure but of course uh, as is our honorable uh, minister has committed we have to go for about say seven to eight percent or so so target is of course 25,000 over the next year and uh, we have to achieve a target of almost uh, say 100% electrification. This is what is to be required to be done. What is the reason particularly for the renewable energy? I will just briefly touch up, upon, touch up upon that. Uh, to reduce carbon footprint of Indian railways and uh, we are working very hard to achieve this result. Then uh, to substitute fossil fuel based power with renewable energy progressively. Uh, a lot of things have been talked about the, for the non-traction. Of course, in non-traction, we have the advantage of having the roof where we can install the solar power and we can take it. And uh, But, of course, for the non-traction space also, we are trying to work out and then we will be deliberating that how, what are the uh, possible manners in which we can do it. Uh, one of the uh, mission is also to procure renewable energy uh, at the economical tariff because uh, with the tariff coming down, as it has been told that... Uh, uh, it, is, it is almost we are paying uh, close to 8 rupees to the state uh, discom. So if we are able to get uh, uh, say around under 4 rupees or 4 rupees 50 paisa that will be really a great thing for the railways and that too also will provide energy security to the railway where the cost will remain fixed for a period of 25 years or so. Then uh, as a licensee uh, since we are taking the power as a licensee we have a status of a utility we also have the renewable purchase obligation. Uh, which is our duty to fulfill it not only as a uh, for the purpose of RPO but also for uh, saving the carbon footprint of the railway, reducing the carbon footprint of the railway. That is also our objective of doing it. Uh, the target over next few years is about 1000 megawatt, which has been told in the morning also that we have to do it. And of course, we are adopting uh, the EPC and uh, the tariff based bidding model because the tariff based bidding model right now is giving an edge over the tariff and then also gives a lot of uh, hassle-free environment there because whatever energy you are buying that you are only paying for that maintenance etc is the responsibility of the bidder which has already been told by the previous speakers. 
Then another area is about the wind power, 200 megawatt wind power. That is also by 2020 we have to achieve that target on which direction we are also working. Of course, there are certain challenges which I will discuss uh, during my ensuing uh, slides or so. So uh, <coughs> now, uh, say basically, what is our renewable purchase obligation uh, of the railway? We have a different kind of uh, uh, railway is a state entity having a pan India presence. So now, uh, this I am talking about only for the traction power because in the non-traction uh, we can we can provide through the solar rooftop. But for the non-traction, how do we have to do it? Uh, this is what is more focused for us. And then uh, it is basically with the two objectives. Uh, one is that uh, to reduce uh, the carbon footprint. The second is that to reduce the cost of power also. In fact, uh, the declining trend into, into the solar power that uh, is being we are uh, getting a very uh, low tariff and uh, as you may be aware that the last uh, lowest tariff was uh, discovered was about 2.44 uh, into the Rajasthan and uh, in uh, and then the next probably 2.54 or something like that so that is the express tariff which we are getting it uh, so if we, we are able to get to that level and the landed tariff to us will be under 4 rupees uh, to the railway. So uh, this uh, state-wise, we have just worked out at how much is the million unit requirement and then how much because the solar purchase obligation, SPO is a solar purchase obligation. The national tariff policy of 2016 is, is states that by 2022, uh, all the utility, state utility and railway also is a, being a licensee has also to uh, comply with this obligation wherein the 8% of the energy use has to, be, has to come from the solar. So uh, this provides us a lot of uh, space and, uh, then, and then the quantum of uh, requirement of the solar power increases uh, manifold. Similarly, there is a non-solar power purchase obligation uh, which are being identified given by the respective state which includes uh, wind energy, solar, other than uh, the solar, uh, whatever the biodiesel is there and then sorry, bioenergy is there, then we have that um, uh, geothermal or uh, any other energy, waste to energy, etc. Everything will be coming into this NSPO thing. So this is what is the mapping of that, how it is coming. And then overall, if we add up for the SPO, so it is somewhere close to about, uh, I can say, uh, close to about seven, uh, about 800 uh, megawatt for the time being. And progressively it will uh, increase because uh, the consumption is likely to be doubled once we go for the electrification, which is right now about 30,000 kilometer. And with the 50,000 kilometer of route electrification or say 60,000 of route kilometer, the energy requirement will, uh, will be doubled. So correspondingly, the SPO requirement will also go very high. So that way we are just requiring to, we have to fulfill those obligations. So what, what is the roadmap and how are we working on that? Um, initially, our target over the next few years is that we have to achieve about 1,000 megawatt of solar. Out of that 1,000 megawatt, 500 is for the non-traction application, which is uh, being used. Out of that, 25 has been commissioned, including the 5 megawatt, which has been uh, commissioned or dedicated by uh, Honorable Minister to the Nation, that plant at uh, Nijamuddin and Delhi area. So that 25 is commissioned, almost 115 to 125 megawatt contracts are awarded and under various execution stages, which we anticipate that uh, in next uh, 8 to 10 months time, this should be in place. So we should be having close to 150 megawatt of solar power. Another 32 megawatt tender has been invited uh, by our EMCL and that, it, that we, it's about to uh, be done. So that leaves to touch, uh, uh, reach the target of 500 megawatt, that leaves the capacity about 328 megawatt or so. Wherein, since it has been committed by the Ministry of uh, New and Renewable Energy that we will provide this central financial assistance. So we are waiting from them. Uh, nevertheless, this, uh, what is the lowest tariff, discovered tariff which we have in the recent tender is about 3.49 uh, per unit uh, with 25% uh, central financial assistance. And that, uh, that tariff remains fixed for a period of 25 years. So we are really getting, uh, and, and as against the tariff of what you are saying that we are paying on an average of say about 7.5 rupees across the country. So that's a really a tremendous uh, reduction to tariff. And what was more surprising that about uh, two megawatt of power we have won without any central financial assistance. And there also we discovered a tariff of four rupees 46 pesa on the rooftop. So that means on the rooftop itself, we are getting uh, the earlier the uh, benchmark of 4 rupees 50 pesa, we have come to sub 450. So that is something a big achievement. And if we go a little on a larger scale, we can uh, go through this uh, further, it can come down. And uh, 
in fact uh, this was a normal uh, conventional bidding which we have uh, done it and if we go further through the reverse auction maybe the cost may further come down so this is what it is something which we are uh, doing it so this was as far as the uh, traction application was concerned of course and we are also planning to go for 500 megawatt of uh, traction power uh, for the traction use this we largely want to do it uh, on a larger scale maybe a plant of uh, uh, not less than 550 megawatt capacity or so so this we are planning uh, as was said that we have a vast railway land where we can try to take this power and then we will try to set up the solar plant there uh, we can go also in a private land if we go for a open bidding then we can take this power through uh, through the private land then we are also pondering to take uh, into this uh, space into the solar state solar park uh, a lot of space, solar parks are available in Rajasthan then we also have an MP so over there we are trying to tie up with the state government and we can take a space and then we can uh, go for a terry based bidding where we can take this power so that is what is a plan for 50 megawatt in Bilai uh, in Chhattisgarh uh, in railway land then 50 megawatt in Rajasthan 200 megawatt is uh, centralized or it can be distributed also state wise so we have pros and cons basically whether we should go for centralized or distributed so all those things are being uh, done by the by us and then we will be coming out uh, with this, some of the proposals recently uh, then uh, uh, to just give a, uh, the uh, a snapshot about how much is the wind energy we already have about 36.5 megawatt uh, in the of the wind energy which is coming in fact, out of this 26 megawatt, we are already using uh, for the traction purpose because though there is a challenge of using and utilization of this power, despite of it, we are uh, able to manage this uh, thing. Then we have another ongoing project, 6 megawatts for non-traction in Maharashtra. This is also for non-traction use. This is what we have, we have asked. We have got a bid also. This was on an experimental and pilot basis. Where this power will directly be given to the us under the banking mode and where the state uh, government will bank this power and we will be coming this power uh, and we expect a rate of tariff of under 5 rupees uh, with this then we uh, have also invited a bit for 10.5 megawatt which uh, the which is already uh, under evaluation and which we f uh, hope that we should be able to complete it uh, quickly the future projects are about to reach a target of uh, 200 megawatt we have remaining capacity of 147 megawatt where uh, we have to uh, we are now trying to go through a tariff based bidding option where we can instead of uh, setting up on our own we can go through a tariff based bidding option because in the recent uh, tender for the wind energy also the tariff was really has crashed down and then the tariff i think 2.64 has uh, has been reported so we are getting a tariff of 2.64 x bus for the wind energy also so that will be really it will provide a very uh, pathway for the railways uh, that uh, whatever is our future requirement a uh, major portion of that we can try to cover up uh, through the renewable energy uh, resources <coughs> so but of course there are certain challenges in harnessing renewable energy and uh, which uh, we are trying to work out various options where we have to really sit down and we have to brainstorm then what best possible manner we can take it uh, first of all since as I told you that railway is the state entity we are taking the power which is varying uh, as low as 25 megawatt of course in Delhi it is about 10 to 12 megawatt but uh, barring Delhi then uh, we have a minimum requirement of 25 megawatt and is going as high as 340 megawatt in one of the bigger state or so so scheduling uh, of renewable energy for traction application as deemed licensing will be one of the challenge where we have to dovetail the uh, renewable power with our conventional power so that uh, that will be the issue where we have to really work out and then we have to define uh, certain ways of uh, doing it then power balancing issues of course remains uh, another thing because once you have the power and then in the evening time once the solar power particularly goes down then we have to ramp up the other uh, generation so that time uh, requirement is there so we need some time for the ramping up of the conventional power so we really have to work out in what way we can do this by balancing issues then uh, sometimes it may be possible that uh, we may have to back down the conventional power during peak generation of renewable power so we have to take due care because the uh, conventional power cannot be closed we have to run it to a technical minimum so below that it is not possible uh, to go and we have to really work that how uh, we, we can uh, address these challenges then uh, to, to some extent we can have some financial implication of fixed charges if we are reducing this uh, power 
So, of course, in fact, I will be coming to the next slide where we are trying to work out that how this can be minimized. The non-banking of renewable energy by DISCOM, because railway is also a licensee and uh, of course for the non-traction use where we are taking the power as a consumer, we can uh, use the banking facility, but for the, uh, for the traction purpose, uh, this uh, is not being uh, permitted by them. Then, uh, uh, the, of course, uh, the transmission charges of the full installed capacity has to be paid if you are installing a 100 megawatt of solar plant. You have to pay the entire charges and though the actual power requirement will be, uh, say you will be taking about 25 uh, megawatts at 25% uh, severe. Uh, so uh, this is what is something. Then uh, MOP guidelines are there for uh, the waiver of CTU charges only for meeting RPO. So of course uh, we have our RPO requirement itself is about uh, 1000 megawatt will be close to 1000 megawatt so we can avail this facility for the CTU connected uh, waiver of CTU connected, connected charges. So that is what uh, maybe the uh, cost, maybe the landed tariff may be a little higher if we go through a conventional method. So what are the options which we just thought that how we can uh, expedite and how we can take it instead of taking in a normal routine manner, we, what, is, what are the way out? One is the banking arrangement with the state discount. We have been in touch with a few of the state which they are saying that we can permit to the banking. The dialogues are on and in fact uh, we may be able to have a breakthrough recently and then we can uh, we can uh, bank that power. So what will happen, say, instead of, say, 500 megawatt of power, I will be coming about, say, 20 megawatt of power constantly. So that will provide me a lot of uh, saving into not only the transmission charges, but also in my scheduling and also in terms of my availability of power. The another uh, concept uh, uh, we are trying to evolve is about this concept of chopped renewable power. So here the advantage will be that we have the reduced transmission charges, then we will have a... a kindly uh, wrap up. Uh, we will be having a scheduling uh, which will be uh, uh, which, which will be having less impact. Then uh, we can go through some of the REC, we can purchase a renewable energy certificate. Then we are working out on the solar wind hybrid plant and uh, maybe we are working with the option of solar plant with battery storage. So this is, this is basically the concept of chopped power where what happens is generation, so suppose if we talk about a plant of 500 megawatt. Now in this case what happens in the, into the bottom portion, shaded portion, uh, the, uh, the dark portion, railway will be taking this power only. So that means uh, though I will be having a capacity of uh, almost this, uh, in terms of curved area it will be about 60% of the power. So even at 200 megawatt uh, capacity, I'll be using the, I will be taking the power of 60 to 65 percent. The remaining power can be taken by uh, the other user and it can be sold by the uh, developer to the other person. So we are, we are going for a bidding option wherein we will commit him to take the power of the lower portion and the upper portion power can be taken by some other user. And it is, it is a very advantageous situation because what happens during the daytime, uh, though the railway may not be needing that kind of power, that power is required by the state discom, but the load is very high during daytime. So they can also take this, they can take this power and um, so this will be the utilized in a proper way. The similar experiment we are trying to do for the wind uh, energy also where we, instead of say out of 100 megawatt capacity, we can take uh, 35 megawatt power uh, almost on a constant basis and the remaining power can be utilized by other users. So what we are trying to do is that for the for this purpose, we have uh, invited all the uh, renewable power developers, solar and wind, and we have invited a meeting. We are having a meeting on 2nd of November uh, at Gurgaon Rights Office, wherein we will discuss these options and in what way the industries are uh, will be cooperating, what is their uh, proposal. And uh, we already had uh, informal discussions with a few developers and they are agreeable to this proposal. So that will be something which will provide a, a good uh, pathway for the railways. And uh, the issues which we'll be discussing is about, say, whether it should be a 12 years period or 25 years period, how much should be the quantum in megawatt and million units, which we have to take under chopping option. Then whether it should be centralized or it can be distributed, we can go for uh, distributed model, whatever is my requirement to that state, we can take only that much of power. And we can evolve and implement concept of solar and wind hybrid project that how uh, if we can take, uh, if we, we are able to take both the hybrid model. In that case, we have a continuity of power. Say normally the wind is there, both of, 
solar and wind are uh, complementary to each other. In the evening time, once the uh, solar power is not there, we will have a wind power. So that will provide a lot of uh, good proposition to us. In fact, we will also discuss during the meeting that if we can have a joint model of solar, wind and uh, battery storage. So the battery storage requirement will be very limited to that extent, but that will provide us the advantage of having a almost a con constant power or round-the-clock power without any further investment. And then we anticipate that the cost of power with this should be under uh, uh, 4 rupees or 4 rupees 50 paisa with this model. So uh, this is uh, what uh, is the overall thing. And if we have some solar power, uh, renewable power developers, so I invite them, the details are available at the website of rights. They can come and then they can discuss and they can come with their suggestions. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I think we um, heard uh, a description of, of the vision for, for the railways in terms of uh, pursuing a renewable power, both from solar and wind and uh, the, the logic behind in terms of reducing both the carbon footprint and, and the cost and the issues associated. Uh, I believe we have a few minutes for uh, questions and answers. We ha got a question um, in advance from, from one of the uh, participants and I'm going to request uh, Shivaram to see if he can uh, address the questions placed. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the cost was about the purchase cost. Uh, the Mr. Saxena ji has uh, uh, answered a part of that in his uh, presentation. So, uh, about the latest experience, what REMCL has shared is uh, a tariff of 4.5 rupees without any uh, CFA, that's some kind of an upfront capital subsidy. And with the 25% uh, tariff, uh, with a 25% capital uh, subsidy, the tariff is uh, 3.5 rupees per unit of power. That's, uh, that's the latest number I right, just took it from your presentation. Uh, in case of uh, uh, the second part of the question is how much is that in case of a, a utility? So in case of a utility, it would be generally a ground mounted uh, power plant and the latest numbers that we are hearing from the market is a 25 year PPA tariff of something like 2.65 per unit without any, uh, any, uh, any uh, CFA. But uh, please keep in mind that uh, the location of the plant, the connectivity, all of this has to have a part in the in the tariff. It's, so it's so even the same ground to ground comparison. It's not obviously an apple to apple comparison. One has to kind of look at it in a different uh, fashion uh, with the passing time. Thank you, Shifram. Uh, if there are any questions, we could take them now. If you could uh, identify yourself and to whom you are directing the question. We still can probably squeeze in a question or two before we take a break. If not, I'll hand it back to you. The presentation has been very useful, informative. There is drafted take takeaway, which is which will be useful for railways in current and future project, both on short term basis and long term basis. Now I request. The chair, the session chair and presenter for group photograph. That's the end of technical session one. We break for lunch. Everybody is requested to join for lunch. Next session, next technical session two, that is technical session two will start at 14, 15 hours. Everybody should be here by 14, 10 hours.